Good morning, fellow delegates. Okay, y'all need to wake up now. Good morning, fellow delegates. My name is Fred Brewington from the New York Annual Conference, uh, and I want to just start out by saying it has been a pleasure listening to the presentations that have come uh, thus far, and I hope that our presentations, and we have a little time each to speak, so I hope you don't mind if we jump right into it. Uh, I've had the uh, privilege of uh, chairing the Jurisdictional Study Committee. And if you see um, on the screen, uh, there's a PowerPoint that we presented, and I'm going to be moving rather quickly. Um, let's, let me first talk about what the Jurisdictional Study Committee uh, is and how it was created. General Conference um, deferred all of the uh, discussions uh, about uh, how jurisdictions should be addressed within the United States until a time where there would be a committee that was created to do a study and bring information back to general conference. That is the group that has been meeting since we last left in 2016 and has been working very, very hard. On your screen, you'll, you'll see um, uh, this uh, PowerPoint slide that talks about there were petitions to change jurisdictional lines. There were petitions to uh, change uh, formula and uh, a number of uh, 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 questions about bishops. And there were petitions to change timing in uh, the, the changes in the number of bishops. In all, there were 23 separate petitions that were collected and provided for us in terms of having guidance. Um, so we're supposed to bring back information to the uh, 2020 uh, General Conference. We got together, met many times, not only in person, but by Zoom uh, phone calls, and came up with this mission statement. The Jurisdictional Study Committee uh, will examine the current realities and missional needs of the UMC for the 21st century and recommend a process to determine the number and boundaries of the jurisdictions and Episcopal areas that align with the missional priorities and common purpose of the UMC so that we live out the call of, of Christ as people committed to be in the connection. There is a word that is mentioned twice in that statement. Somebody want to tell me what the M word is? Missional. This body put before it an evaluation, an evaluation of whether or not there would be um, a new way of looking at how and in what way numbers of bishops should be allocated and where they should be allocated. The membership of the uh, study committee um, is up before you, and if you'll see uh, some of the best and the brightest um, in, in our, our uh, denomination were part of this, and I must tell you, it was great to be around a lot of great thinkers on the table. If there are members of the Jurisdictional Study Committee that are here, would you please stand so that people can see who you are, because they're going to have questions. I see one, Lonnie here. Um, okay, there we go. We have, we have three. And please give them a hand, and Bishop in the back. These individuals worked very hard, and, and let me say, I, I had the honor of working with them, um, especially given the time and place and history that we find ourselves um, within our church. So as we went forward, um, we uh, took a look at what the current paragraph 404 of the um, discipline provides to us. And in this situation, what we did see was that we had numbers according to the current formula. There's a word. Formula that exists, that there was going to be a change, particularly going into 2020 in through and 2024, according to the current formula. You have that there by jurisdiction. And as you can see, every jurisdiction, paragraph 404 provides that every jurisdiction is entitled to a minimum of five bishops. And thereafter, an additional bishop for every 300,000 members, also funded by the apportionment uh, to all jurisdictional and annual conferences. 
as we spoke about that and talked about the missional needs of the church and many of the missional needs geographically and regionally, we came to the point of seeing that there may be a way that's more consistent with making disciples for Jesus Christ than just dealing with sheer numbers. So we proposed that in this situation, every jurisdiction is be entitled to a minimum of five, but also that the number of additional bishops the jurisdiction determines is necessary to accomplish the ministry and mission funded by the apportionment to annual conferences within that jurisdiction. So therefore, we have suggested, and you'll see our suggestions at the end, that we not be driven just by numbers, that we not be driven just by sheer numbers because, for instance, in a metropolitan area where there may not necessarily be numbers that can fill the role of 300,000, there may be intense needs with regard to missional uh, uh, purposes that would drive the ministry that needs to take place there. And because of that, bishops may be appropriate and necessary if found to be necessary by that geographic area. There are interlocking um, uh, authorities, and we found that it was important for us to consider the judicial decisions, 1312, um, that talked about uh, the systems and balancings, uh, the balances uh, of constraints in the powers, colleges, bishop, the College of Bishops, general conference, and jurisdictional conferences all work in a way where they intertwined to try and come to a point in making determinations about the bishops in that geographic area. How would it work? Well, if you take a look here, there's more flexibility uh, for the near term uh, to really be evaluated in terms of how things work. Because when you look at the college of bishops, you look at the financial capacity uh, of the jurisdictions and jurisdiction episcopacy Episcopacy committees that would be involved in making initial decisions, it would then meld to an organization that many of you have met, never heard of in your United Methodist lives. It's called the Inter-Jurisdictional Committee on the Episcopacy. Everybody heard of that? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody hasn't heard of that. Raise your hand. Everybody doesn't care. Raise, no, I'm sorry. But, but in this situation, the, the real issue here is that there is a mechanism that we are proposing for making sure that the, the missional needs that are uh, set out can be evaluated, can be examined, and then determinations can be uh, made as to um, the number of bishops. Funding of bishops and general expenses. Allocation to the uh, annual conference, there's no changes to central conference areas uh, funding. But all funding flows through the Episcopal Fund, commonly referred to as the EF. All support systems and financial policies are established by GCFA as administrators of the Episcopal Fund. And all bishops are bishops of the whole church. Uh, and uh, the extra bishops aren't necessarily associated with an individual name. But in this situation, if you'll see here before you, we're talking about a, a total apportion sufficient to support these activities per geographic area. So that minimum of five, and then after that, there's an opportunity based on the ability to fund in each geographic area. Total costs for additional bishops divided by the, and added to the Episcopal Fund apportionment becomes a real question. Funding of missional necessary bishops is a question that we began to address. And this is how we started to figure out how to do it. We talked about apportionment of general expenses. We're running over. Okay, and I'm running over, so let me just take a very quick look at numbers, since that appears to be an issue. <laughs> Cost implications after office expenses. And this is what it would look like in terms of changes for the current dollar amounts 
per jurisdiction. And these are just uh, jurisdictions within the United States, obviously. And if you look at those numbers, our report that sets these out gives a full explanation. We have proposed a timeline on how to get there. And if you will take a look at our um, executive summary that is part uh, of the plan that we have provided, it not only sets it out uh, in a total of eight pages, but there are five pieces of legislation with clear rationale that speak about each. And this is a response to an assignment from General Conference. Our response, I believe, is well uh, thought out uh, and contemplated to try and meet the missional needs as we go further into uh, the future of the United Methodist Church. I thank the people that worked on this with me, and I'm going to yield now so that we have time for the other speakers. Thank you very much. Good morning, church. My name is George Howard, lay delegate from West Ohio, and I am staff with Global Ministries to the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters. How many of you were at the 2016 General Conference? I'm reporting back to you what you asked us to do. So, the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters is a standing committee. It works between general conferences. It's made up of a bishop, a lay person, and a clergy person from each jurisdiction and from each central conference. So there, and there's a little more than that, but there are about 36, 38 members of the standing committee. Our job, we're given three things to do. First is we receive legislation that applies to the uh, central conferences. And I learned just in the last presentation that we're going to have 23 of them given to us, that we will talk about and make recommendations and put our recommendations to the floor of General Conference. That's one. Two, we were asked to take a look at the General Book of Discipline and to, take, and to see which pieces of that were adaptable and which pieces were not adaptable by Central Conferences. Uh, D. Stickley Minor is going to bring uh, some information about that. The third thing is, you asked us to, to do an Africa comprehensive plan to look at where to place five new bishops in Africa. And Bishop Palmer is going to say something about that. Before Bishop Palmer comes, I'd like to make three uh, observations about the role of bishops in Africa. In my experience, their, their, their expectations are different from bishops in the United States. For example, one of them is, when I go to a bishop's home, there are 20 to 40 people lined up starting at 4 o'clock in the morning to see that bishop and talk to him about marriage counseling, about finances, about the state of the church. They, they all bring their thing. It reminds me of Moses. That's what happens every day in the life of an African bishop. The second thing. They are national leaders. The national leaders of the, of the country come to them when there are crises. When the Ebola crisis happens in West Africa, it was the bishops who stood up and led the nations. When there are, peace, when, when there are wars going on, it's the African bishops who are asked to come in and help mediate peace. Very different from what happens here. And the third thing is, there are... There are parts of their Episcopal areas that do not have United Methodist churches, and these bishops go and lead evangelism campaigns to start new churches. Very different from how we operate here. Thank you. Bishop? Thank you, Brother George and uh, colleagues, and good morning to all of you. Uh, as has been said earlier, um, the General Conference uh, that will meet in 2020 is not uh, especially bound uh, by anything previously decided, uh, except uh, the 2016 General Conference, as Heather said, did give us some homework. So one of the uh, assignments that we were given in the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters was to look at the matter um, of the, the General Conference approved are moving from 13 to 18, so an increase of five new bishops. 
to bring a report back to the 2020 General Conference about a recommendation about where those bishops would go and any attendant recommendations. So just on this slide, and you can uh, find it elsewhere, uh, you can re uh, remember and recall the assignment that the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters was given. Uh, moving uh, hastily, uh, the process we used uh, included three uh, broad-based conversations so that the work was not just contained in the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters uh, and um, uh, in its Committee on uh, the Africa Comprehensive Plan. But we held three consultations, but two of them in particular brought together people, lay and clergy, uh, as well as Episcopal leadership from every Episcopal area in, uh, on the continent of Africa in order to speak in to the recommendation, to help gather data, to help us understand and assess and weigh criteria that we thought or would come to think would be important in making any recommendations. That said, uh, we had three basic criteria that drove our work. Uh, the first you see in, in, three, the, in, in three columns, so uh, things that would be thought about in terms of Episcopal uh, leadership and what goes with it. And then you had playing in the background precisely what George Howard just suggested to you is very different about the role of bishops in Africa, and it may be true also in other central conferences than it is for the jurisdictional bishops. So you can see we tried to weigh um, all of these things and to find the intersection of them in coming to our recommendations. So number of active clergy, uh, versus the number of annual conferences, geography. Uh, we also uh, did look at factors of what if um, everything in the central conferences in Africa uh, began to be organized around economy, around communication, and around transportation. And, um, but at the end of the day, these criteria drove us, even though we had a number of scenarios. You have some petitions uh, that are in the ADCA that you've received now electronically or, as we were told earlier, um, have been shipped to our respective homes or offices. And uh, our recommendation around the five new Episcopal areas is on um, this wise, that there be uh, in the Africa Central Conference, as currently constituted, that there would be uh, two new Episcopal areas with the suggestion, and it's important for you to underscore that, because the authority for determining the boundaries and names of the annual conferences uh, is resident to the Central Conference. But our suggestion, and this is all a part of the petition, is that those uh, uh, new Episcopal areas would be in Burundi and a second one in Zimbabwe. That the Congo Central Conference would receive two uh, new Episcopal Episcopal areas, and that within it, North Katanga and South Congo uh, Episcopal areas, and then the West Africa Central Conference, that there be one uh, new Episcopal area with a suggestion that it uh, be in, uh, in Nigeria, which would create two Episcopal areas in Nigeria. Another petition in regard to this is that the total number, uh, that a total of four Central Conferences uh, I went too fast, how do I get back? Okay, that a total of four central conferences in Africa and the renaming of existing ones. So currently there are three, and we recommend that there be four central conferences in Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. This picture will help you to understand that recommendation and the picture that comes after it. So this uh, roughly hewn uh, drawing in of the map uh, shows where the conferences are as they exist now. So the greenish is the West Africa Central Conference, the orangish color is the Congo Central Conference, and then the yellow, which you see wraps around uh, a good bit of the Congo Central Conference, uh, represents what is now the Africa Central Conference. Our recommendation, and last slide, is that the, the greenish area would still be the West Africa Central Conference, 
the orangish would become the uh, Congo, would be the Congo Central Conference, the yellow would be the Africa Central Conference, and the brownish, uh, as it may appear on the screen, would become the East Africa Central Conference. Uh, these, of course, are all recommendations to the delegates uh, of, the, of the General Conference. Now, uh, regarding one looming question, in light of everything else that's taken place since 2016, in light of 2019, in light of the continual um, conversation we hear about declining resources, about um, uh, the uh, sense of uh, contraction of the Episcopal Fund and its reserves, why this? <clears throat> it's a simple answer. The delegates to 2016 asked for this report. The Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters did not believe it had the authority to dis or ignore the 2016 General Conference and not do the work because of other information coming together. Thirdly, the 2020 General Conference can do as it sees fit. <clears throat> Thank you, Bishop. Um, hello, my name is Dee Stickley Minor. I am an ordained deacon serving in West Ohio. In this quadrennium, I've had the amazing opportunity um, to serve on the Standing Committee for Central Conference Matters and was elected its um, secretary. Um, I have three minutes. Okay, so, oh, I only have one minute? No. I have three minutes? All right, so I am going to try to breeze through what is the General Book of Discipline in three minutes. So um, we'll see if I can um, fly through this. Um, the General Book of Discipline um, would be, it's an attempt that was being given to us from um, General Conference to look at um, what really is essential to bind us together around the world in a covenant with each other understanding that covenant is giving ourselves away to one another and God. And that covenant is really grounded in grace, accountability, forgiveness, and relationship. And so our current book of discipline is over 815 pages, and that does not translate across different um, cultures. And so um, what we're really seeking to do is, what is it that binds us together? And then how do we actually give freedom to our different regions and central conferences um, to be able to then develop what makes sense in their context? Why is this important? We all know in our own ministry that ministry is contextual. Um, how I do ministry on the south side of Columbus is different than how I do it on the north side of Columbus. The beauty of being with the Central Conference um, Standing Committee is that we hear stories. We hear the narratives of life and ministry. In, in places where people walk for two weeks to get to the annual conference session, we know that something is different. And so it's important for us to be able to look at um, what is it that binds us together instead of trying to dictate how everything happens. And it really is about how do we give each other um, freedom. And when we remember the Book of Discipline was created when um, we were essentially a US-centric um, church. And um, somebody said yesterday that if we see um, those outside of us as an extension of ourselves, that's a colonial understanding. So this gives us an opportunity to be able to live in covenant instead of exporting our cultural ways of doing things and organizing ourselves um, around the world. And so we really believe that's important. And even maybe more so now, given everything that's happening, um, what does it mean for us to maintain a global identity that values each other and that trusts that leaders in North Katanga are gonna do ministry in a way that makes sense and that leaders across the United States are gonna do ministry in ways that make sense. And so we believe that that is important and it allows us the opportunity to be able to look outside of our own worldview. When we hear and see other stories and other ministries, um, we begin to understand um, the true beauty that God created in the very beginning of the diversity and how God asks us to bless the diversity so that it can multiply. And so we believe that a general book of discipline will allow us to multiply the Methodist mission and witness across all of our context and can hold us together in covenant. And so what is it that we're asking you to do? So as you heard, the Standing Committee is not an agency. 
our members have done this work across the quadrennium with amazing partnership with the members of the Faith and Order Committee, members of Connectional Table, and members of the Study and Ministry Commission. And so, um, because we're not an agency, there wasn't funding, um, and so we actually raised um, the money so that the draft of the General Book of Discipline could be printed and translated in our um, official language, languages of the denomination. It is in your ADCA. Please read your draft that is in there because what we are asking for is for you to read it, to convene some consultations and conversations following General Conference, to provide feedback back to the Standing Committee. It's your opportunity and for people around the world to look at that product of our work to say, man, you all are way too detailed in this. And so maybe this is really better off not being in the non-adaptable piece, which is the piece that only General Conference can amend, and it can be put over here where our regions and central conferences can adapt. So please read, convene conversations, provide the feedback. The standing committee for next quadrennium will be working with general conference staff to be in touch with you all's delegations because we can't tell you an email address to send those things to because we're not an agency. Um, and then the second thing is, is that there is, a, um, there is legislation um, coming to you all that is asking you all to continue the mandate to work on the general book of discipline. And we've made an, um, a change in it. And we're asking you to give us the freedom to add some new words, because our current mandate only allowed us to work with the words in the current book of discipline and to move some here and some here. If we really want to be able to get it up outside of just a US context, um, we have to be able to add some words. And it's hard to move a sentence here and a sentence there and for it to make sense. And so that's the, that's the ask that we're making of you. Um, and we ask that you just keep um, the members of the standing committee in your prayers. It really is an amazing group of people um, who have learned, as um, Pastor Betty said yesterday, to mutually listen um, to one another. Thank you. Nobody mentioned this, I don't think, but the standing committee on Central Conference Matters is the one leadership body in the church where the majority of membership is from, are from Central Conferences. So that's really cool. Anyhow, since we have interpreters, and with that idea that we're very international, since we have interpreters, we ask that everybody who asks a question, please, ask us, please speak slowly, which I'm having a hard time doing myself, so I'm, I'll extend that grace to you. But yes, we are asked to speak slowly. And we ask all our speakers to speak slowly and at a moderate pace to help our interpreters keep up. And with that in mind, does anybody have any questions? The microphones are open. All right. Hi, please ask your question. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jasper Peters. I'm clergy from the Mountain Sky Conference. I use he, him pronouns. Bishop Palmer, I think this is directed uh, at you. I recognize the 2016 General Conference was almost four years ago, and my memory might be failing me, but if I remember correctly, I, I thought that there were the initial suggestion or thought was that there might be four additional bishops uh, in, uh, across the African Central Conferences and one that might be assigned to the Philippines. Now, if I'm misremembering, please let me know, but I'm wondering if there was a change, and if so, if you could help us understand why. My recollection and the way in which the committee did its work uh, is that the petition was specific. So that first slide that I went very fast from was for the actual language from the petition. Was there ever a conversation about a need for an additional bill up in the Philippines area? And is there a sense that there's a need that we're not addressing? Or, or is the understanding that there's a sufficient uh, allocation of, of energy and resources already? The standing committee, this quadrennium, did not take on that conversation. But I would not dispute that the conversation happens in a number of places. So it would be up to um, the uh, Philippine Central Conference, perhaps, uh, to bring something forward, but certainly for the delegates to decide if that's a, an, an additional priority that they'd like to have emphasized. Thank you. So for um, further clarification, um, one of the other things that the Standing Committee did complete this quadrennium is that we did an assessment 
of the Episcopal areas um, within the Central Conference of the Philippines. So we had teams that, that spent about a week in each of the three central conferences engaged in conversation um, with leaders, with lay clergy and the bishops. And it was the, um, it was the recommendation of that team in consultation with the current bishops and then approved um, by the standing committee is that currently um, the Philippines as a central conference has the Episcopal leadership um, that, is, um, that, that, is, that is needed. And um, information on that, it can be found in our standing committee report in your ADCA. And as usual, we only have time for one more question. We've got one person up here, so head Perfect. away. Um, Molly McIntyre, lady from Florida. Uh, this is a question for Bishop Palmer. Um, two things. Where is the funding coming from the, for the five new bishops? And if the budget has to be changed due to the funding needs related to the protocol, how would we reduce the number from five? And what are the, pri the areas of priority? All right, I may need you to repeat the All second right. part, but let me okay. go to the first part. In that slide that's gone now, the first one that I uh, referred to that had the legislation in it, the legislation was specific and it used shall that the funding for the five new bishops was to be included in the quadrennial budget proposed. So in your ADCAs, uh, the budget for the Episcopal Fund for the next quadrennium is it is included there. So that was a part of the mandate. Um, there was collaborative work um, and GCFA worked uh, and is still working very hard. So the funding is set. All of the places that that may pinch um, or create other strains, I, I can't speak to, but perhaps um, someone from the General Council on Finance and Administration can. Help me with the part B of your question. Okay, so if the funding needs to be changed related to the protocol, um, how would we reduce the number um, if we don't need five? And is there a priority in certain areas? Um, is that addressed so that we can make sure that the priority or the needs are met? So the standing, uh, the task force, the Comprehensive uh, Africa Task Force and uh, in consultation with leadership from the General Council and Finance and Administration has discussed some what ifs. I wanna say all of those discussions took place in 2019 and they precede the mediation and they precede uh, the protocol and they were exclusively focused on the strains and uh, perhaps the anticipated constraints on the Episcopal Fund uh, that are fairly widely uh, known throughout, throughout the church. And so there have been some what if scenarios that if we needed to prioritize um, um, any form of what has been referred to by some as phasing in of uh, the five, bish five new bishops for Africa where we might go first. However, the petition in front of the delegates uh, meets the criteria of the legislation, which was to do the work on the five and suggestions as to where they would be placed. I would just add that the standing committee is a continuous body that meets through General Conference. They're present at General Conference. So if the body requests a different opinion from the standing committee, they are there to be able to gather, make a recommendation, and come back to the body. 